One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. Where's my, where's my microphone? Is it on? Oh, I'm on. Okay, good. Welcome to another, uh, well, a little technical glitch version of Security Guy Radio. Back from Black Hat with very high technical people. And, Therese, we had some uh, technical glitches getting started, but thank goodness we're <laughs> up and running right now. Everything's good. Welcome back to the Never show. Never fails. So we produced 43 episodes, which is pretty amazing if you think about it, at Black Hat, right? It was crazy. It was nonstop. Yeah, and I still, I only got, I got all the video, all the audio is out now. And I'm still working on the video. I only did 15 videos so far, but uh, I have to get ready for as is. I'm going to as is in a couple of weeks, and I'll be hopefully streaming live there with my new uh, live equipment we're going to use from Livestream.com, and that'll be pretty exciting. And what's with the? Uh, that'll be exciting, yeah. Now I saw your little uh, social media posting about your uh, your new hair color there. You didn't look happy about it. Yeah, you know, I was trying to go for like that chic look. Oh, the Veronica just, like, Lake thing. Veron- you don't even know who Veronica Lake is. You're too young to know who that is. But no, I don't know who that is. But, my, but, but our- it got a lot of likes, so it must be working. That's right. It's all about likes. It's all about the likes. Yeah. Now, what was one of your favorite products at uh, Black Hat? Oh wow, there there were so many. Um, what I would rather say is I found that there was a very common theme of a problem that's being trying to be solved. It seemed by all the vendors, whether you were in anti-malware, whether you were in threat intelligence, mm-hmm. it seemed like all the different types of vendors were trying to approach the same problem by combining um, what's known as machine learning with user behavior analytics, with file integrity. In some shape or form, everybody was saying the same key buzzwords in their product evolution. So I thought that was interesting that everybody's throwing their hands into what is called threat intelligence. Right, and they kind so, of share, not share an actual data between themselves, but they kind of, and sometimes they do actually, but the data each company gathers is used to analyze things a little differently. And uh, I was, I felt uh, mostly safe <laughs> after I had a, every interview. <laughs> a couple of interviews I said, oh, I'm worried now about what's going on. But for the most part, there's some very, very smart people out there protecting us, and I'm very glad to hear that. Now, one of those very smart people and companies just happens to be Bay Dynamics, that was one of my favorites. And we just happen to have Stephen Grossman on the phone from Bay Dynamics. Welcome, Steve. Welcome. Welcome to the show live this time. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank oh, you so go. much. Yeah, now. Great to, be, great to be here. Tell everybody what Bay Dynamics, baydynamics.com. Everybody check it out. And tell us what Bay Dynamics does in case people had not seen your Black Hat interview. So Bay Dynamics does cyber risk analytics. And what cyber risk analytics means is bringing all your important uh, cyber data together, your threats, your vulnerabilities, and especially your asset data, in order to be able to measure and communicate uh, those cyber risks uh, across the enterprise and across the organization. Now, this is unusual in one way because people tend to work in silos inside companies. And IT department has this data, HR has this data, security has that data. And your product, if I'm describing this correctly, gathers that data and, and puts it together in a place where we can analyze it together. Is that a good way to describe it? It does. And as Sharice was saying about many of the vendors in Black Hat, so, you know, we've been kind of down the road of, of machine learning, and, and it's an important part of our product, as well as is threat intelligence. But what we've figured over the, over the uh, years that we've been in business and, and the years the product has been out is that you really need to bring all that other data together on top of that machine learning in order for it to be a value. And so to make it applicable to, to everybody in your organization, and to connect the dots uh, between all those people. Now, distinguish Bay Dynamics product from somebody else. Uh, it's a, and forgive me because I I listen to so many people. My small reptilian security guy radio brain can't get its handle around all these geniuses I talk to. But uh, there was a distinction between your product and others. It was a little different. Tell us about that. Uh, absolutely, and and we're actually really happy to announce uh, the release of version 5.0 today. Actually, went into general release today. And so what's really different about our product is, is that we bring all this information together 
we apply those analytics and then we push it out to all the different people in your organization. There are many companies, there are companies that do what they call UEBA, behavioral analytics, which, which we do do uh, as part of our product. There are companies that do vulnerability uh, management, uh, but there's nobody that brings together all that data together, together with your assets and really puts it in a way that's very understandable, consumable, and, and automated to be pushed out to everybody in your organization. So, for example, uh, in today's, uh, today's release, the, the big upgrade is really to our assets at risk solution. And assets at risk is really about optimizing your vulnerability lifecycle management. Big companies run many scans and they get thousands and thousands of vulnerabilities. They see CVEs, they run pen tests. Being able to make sense of all that data and prioritize it in a way that really aligns to how your organization works, right? Making sure that you're, that you're paying attention to the most important applications that are associated with those vulnerabilities uh, is really important. So uh, is this tool really for upper management, executive? Could it span across different levels of management based on the types of reports or what you t what you want to gather out of the out of the platform? That's a great question. I mean, our, but one of our buzz lines and, and, and really one of the one of our mantras is making security everybody's business. And so we, we really work from the operational side. And so for vulnerability management, that means the people that are actually responsible for, for managing the vulnerabilities, the application owners who are, who are responsible for managing their applications, uh, as well as the IT fixers who are responsible for patching those applications and coordinating that dance operationally. But just as important, floating that information up, as you're saying, to the executive management, to, to the compliance officers, so the PCI, uh, PCI auditors and, and the folks who are responsible for PCI or, or whatever regulatory uh, compliance framework in your company, uh, it automates all those metrics, it automates all that reporting so that uh, you're, you're able to get continuous compliance, you're able to see your posture each and every day, and you're able to understand wh where your exposures are each and every day at the executive level, as well as all the way up to the board. We, we have board scorecarding as well. Uh, that brings all that in a very consumable, non-technical way to, to the board. No, oh, that's fabulous. And th there was a lot of visuals involved in this, if I remember correctly. And the visuals are important for the executive in that it's a quick, um, thorough view of what's happening in a short period of time. So, the, and Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to look at it every day if you had to read 10,000 logs. So you're boiling it down to some visualizations that they can make decisions on. Is that a good way to describe it? Absolutely. I mean, many companies, that they have many people scrambling around, extracting data, combining data and spreadsheets, uh, pushing it out to some other, some other databases and, and, and doing a lot of twisting and turning with the data, which ultimately a re results in a delay of getting that data to the right people. But it also automatically pretty much introduces errors and it introduces bias, right? As soon as humans are in the process uh, to, to, to put the data together, there's some bias that goes into it, even if it's unintentional. Pesky now, do humans. you feel like uh, there's a changing trend in, in, I would say, more of a demand that boards are no longer just aware, but more active in understanding the cyber risks, and therefore a platform like yours could really be leveraged to communicate those risks? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. We've actually sponsored a couple of surveys by the Osterman Group, uh, actually speaking to board members as well as speaking to CISOs who present to the boards. You, in order to understand the dynamics there and, and, and how everybody feels about the reporting. And, and what we found out is that boards, A, are, are really pushing very hard to get the right information. Uh, they feel that the information being presented right now is, is way too technical and, and not presented in a way that's very consumable for, for board members who are not necessarily security experts. Most of them understand the language of risk. They don't necessarily understand the language of security to the point where, where they, they quoted statistics uh, where they'll basically uh, fire CISOs or, or, or have CISOs move on if, if they eventually don't report the proper kind of metrics to, uh, to the board. Now, that's an interesting concept um, because I think what that can do is in, introduce bias in your interpretation. In other words, if I explain it to you technically and it's ones and zeros and you understand it technically, there's not a lot of room there for interpreting what the data means. But if I have to translate the ones and zeros into uh, – a crayon picture on a napkin because you don't get it, then I, I, I might introduce some bias in that presentation. But what your product does is it's going to take the actual ones and zeros and translate it into a real, you know, a orange for orange, apple for apple kind of a presentation that says all this stuff means you got a big problem. It's, a, it's oversimplification, but that's really the idea. Because I get it that some people at that decision-making level aren't technical, and maybe they shouldn't be, but they do have to understand how to evaluate a risk. And that's what I liked about uh, the product when we looked at you at, at Black Hat, it seemed that this is a 
a product that boils it down for almost anybody to understand at any level. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we haven't seen a lot of uh, crayon pictures or, or sock puppets uh, being presented to the board, but uh, we have seen a lot of very technical metrics in terms of, you know, num number of vulnerabilities on, on mass and, and the such without putting it in the context of the risk to the organization, without putting it in the context of the risk to, to their most important applications. Um, and, and so we strongly feel that putting it in the language of risk um, inherently makes it understandable to, to folks that have been dealing with risk in all sorts of other areas of, of their uh, board. Now, before, <clears throat> before we started reporting uh, data in this format, and you specifically, I guess, did you find that, that decisions were not being made as quickly and as easily at the sea level to, to mitigate this risk because they didn't understand it? Was that the disconnect? They were afraid to execute because they weren't sure what they were executing? Well, I mean, they, they were making decisions without complete information. Right? Okay. And so the, the decisions that were being made were, were difficult to, to, uh, to make in the first place. And more importantly, it was very difficult to track on an ongoing basis, right? It's very hard to understand whether the, the dollar you put into Tool X or Process X today, uh, a quarter from now, actually had the impact that, that was promised because there, were, there was no easy way of comparing it in, in an apples-to-apples -apples fashion like, like you mentioned earlier. Well, Steve, it's, it's Risk Fabric is the product. Your 5.0, is that what you said, the brand new version? It is. Right. And how do we, we go to baydynamics.com, and then is there a backslash for Risk Fabric, or is it on the main page? How do we find it? No, it's, it's on the main page, okay. baydynamics.com. And uh, certainly on, on the contact page, you'll uh, see how you can reach out to us and, uh, and go from there. Steve, thanks for coming on the show. It's been really fascinating. Therese, Thank uh, you. great product. Thank you. One of my favorites at uh, yes. Black Hat USA 2016 Las Vegas. Steve, thanks for, for Skyping with us and being patient on the, uh, the connection. Thanks again. Great chatting with you all again. Have a great night. Bye, Steve. Now, <clears throat> what, I, what I was going to think we might do tonight, Therese, is play another Black Hat episode, but I'm not sure we have it queued up. Um, okay. But what are what are things that you take out of Black Hat that were that were important? I, I felt very good that there's a lot of smart people working on a lot of problems simultaneously and kind of working together, you know, maybe not directly as companies, but kind of as an industry to solve some issues. Did you get that feeling? I did. And so one of the things that a lot of vendors were uh, key on, keen on talking about was the, th the, the process of sharing information, sharing that intel, because when you cast – when you share with other vendors their intel, your scope of data to pull from and give back to your customer base is much larger. So in turn, the sharing is a win-win for everybody if, you know, as long, and they're called coalitions, and you're going to start to see that with some of the major players, um, and Palo Alto is sponsoring one of the big threat intel um, coalitions. Um, but again, I feel like everybody's jumping on the bandwagon of, a element of threat intelligence to be able to include that into their product. So we'll see how how these vendors that traditionally don't play in the threat intelligence space um, fare out. Oh, you think they're throwing these things in to try to make some more profit, but that's not their specialty. Oh, absolutely. And what you see is a lot of companies adopting a new approach or added capabilities. For example, you're, it was very evident with what's traditionally known as antivirus, now anti-malware. But along with your anti-malware, malware, they're adding capabilities um, that are known as um, early detection and response so that you can be able to contain and mitigate and then even do forensics on the actual malware that's identified, put it in a sandbox, address. I mean, it's all, it's just a, a big old, you know, rabbit hat and they're pulling out capabilities left and right to compete with your what's called next gen threat intelligence providers. So again, they're, they're going out of their traditional market space of capability to compete. And so we'll see how it fares out for a lot of these vendors. How do you, how do we pull apart the experts in that field then? I got that impression that the 43 people we interviewed had distinct uh, skills, right, and expertise. Not too much overlap in the people we interviewed. A few here and there. I mean, Steve and Beta Dynamics obviously seems like they kind of invented some of this stuff and they've been in space a long time. How do you, how do you differentiate between some guy that's new in that one particular threat analysis space 
because he just put it as an add-on or an app on his program instead of well, the actual experts. Well, that's why you call the cyber experts. And the, and the reason I say that, that you call the cyber experts is because they know the minutia and the differences between capabilities. And it's very hard for a non-technical and novice individual when they're buying a product and they think they're getting some level of protection when if you read the fine print, it may not do what you think it's going to do. So you have to do your research. Um, for example, uh, a new, ant or it's not a new, but a common uh, antivirus known as Bit9, um, which had a really large market space. They're trying to stay above the power curve. So they uh, basically merged with a company called Carbon Black that was there at Black Hat. And they, Carbon Black brings an extra suite of capabilities that the Bit9 base functionalities did not have. Um, so you really got to know what you're trying to protect, one, and how those threats are imposing on your environment, two, and and then figure out what you want to, how you want to do it, how you want to manage it, and what you want to get out of it. Do so you think some companies are, are, are watering down their, their capabilities by adding these things? Absolutely. Interesting. Absolutely. All right. They're they're straying away from their core product offering to be competitive. Right. Right. Now, if we didn't have enough things to worry about, uh, what do you think about drones? Because drones, oh, wow. drones the, worry me. They're the cool toys. They're <laughs> the cool toys out in the market. Everybody has a drone now, but I don't. <laughs> and soon they're going to be illegal, I'm sure, because the government's going to say they're not nice. But there's a lot of other security concerns about it. And I thought our, our other part of the show today, we bring in a drone expert. We kind of touched on it after Orlando with venue security, but we really haven't had a drone expert. And it just so happens, I happen to have one on the line with me. It's Mr. James from uh, Star River Global Risk Analysis. And James, how are you? Welcome to the show. Welcome. <laughs> well, it took a lot of fancy programming to get you on that three shot. We finally got you on. That's awesome. Hey, thanks a lot, Chuck, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it seems like uh, it seems like the what I call the revolution is starting to take over. You know, and everybody wants a drone. Everybody's into a drone. Everybody wants to play with them and do all kinds of great things. And you know, the uh, it's 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 kind of funny because it's what I call the evolution, right? So you know, the technology continues to become smaller and smaller um, and much more user friendly uh, across the board. So what once was about the size of a softball is now the size of a golf ball, and by next week will probably be the size of a marble. I want one so, of those uh, James Bond flying mosquitoes. That's coming, isn't it? I've heard yeah, they even have you those. Know, it's, it's right around the corner because, yeah. you know, you've got the uh, U.S. Army that's working on a, on, a, on what looks like a Beetle drone. I mean, it's about the size of a, a Matchbox car, and it does fly. has several cameras. It rotates. It walks. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a couple of other interesting little projects that have been going on with utilizing live cockroaches and some kind of bionic implants. And I know that sounds crazy and really out there, but people are actually working on this, right? The cockroach cam. That's the next thing we need is a cockroach yeah, cam. Cockroach cam. I mean, you know, it'd be a great I thing. Mean, here, <laughs> here's a little fun fact. Under our current president um, administration, they've launched the most uh, drone attacks and fat and experience the highest fatalities with drone using drones. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Well, Very interesting. Drones have been drones have been around since you know for a long time. I mean, you know, the U.S. Air Force was utilizing unmanned systems during Vietnam, um, and I mean, there's just case after case of, of 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 you know the use of unmanned systems. But the thing is, is that we kind of need to look at, at at drones in two different lights, right? So you have the military military side of things, and now you have the civilian side. And this is where things are getting scary is on the civilian side. Because, again, it's that technology that I talked about earlier that's becoming much more uh, user-friendly, right? So a couple of years ago, I was approached by a, a very good friend of mine, Bruce Wimmer, and he asked me, if I could help him during a, a presentation and we were talking about drones and different kinds of technology. And at that point I kind of said, yeah, sure. And I committed to the project. And what I had done was I did a massive amount of research before ASIS in Atlanta. And um, two weeks before the show, I had purchased my first drone um, utilizing YouTube videos, uh, user manuals and various things. I learned how to use Linux and Butu and actually reprogrammed the drone that I bought off the shelf um, to you know, be able to target in on a specific color pattern. And this oh. was just two weeks before ASIS. So I mean, 
you know, I'm not the most tech savvy person in the world, but I was able to do this uh, within a two week time frame, which is just, you know, if me utilizing, you know, just the Internet can do this. Imagine what somebody else with serious intent can do. Right. Now, so, you said I mean, you said you taught it to uh, zoom in on a color pattern, like a, a red car or something like that. Or what What was it? Zoom right, in? right. Exactly. So I put to, I put three uh, a palette together of three colors. And um, the system, the, utilizing the the, uh, the camera, it would hone in on specifically that color pattern. So I mean, um, it, it was it was kind of funny because at, in Atlanta, I had a friend of mine. He was standing there. And he was holding up this sign. It was the three colors, and the drone actually went after him. <laughs> like it literally just took off and and tried to get him. And it was the funniest thing because I mean, it's just you know, I it's, these things. The technology is a little bit unpredictable, but I mean, it did exactly what I wanted it to do, right? Now, when did it when did it become a drone? Because back in the day, I'm older than both of you. Uh, <laughs> it was a Cox airplane, right? And my first outing to fly was Dad took me to the park after Christmas with my Cox Corsair airplane, and we put gas in it and lit it up with a battery, which is very dangerous. We'd all be put in jail for that now. And then he said, "Okay, let it go," and the string started flying around a circle, and I got dizzy and vomited, and the plane went up there and came down and crashed, and I never flew again. That was it. I didn't get the remote control airplane back then, which were thousands of dollars. And, you know, we called them helicopters, Cox airplanes, and helicopters. When, when did the drone thing come in? Is that because if it's a military term or Star Wars coined that or what? Because drone sounds like uh, drone sounds evil, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the funny thing because it's, you know, the, the drone, I, I'm not too – sure exactly who started the term drone if it was the military for or if it was the civilian side that was working with the military but the thing is is what you, you kind of brought up an interesting an interesting part when did it become the actual drone and this this has happened this transition has happened in the last five years where the technology has become smaller and smaller and smaller and more you know m more readily available so chuck what i'm trying to what i'm what, what i'm trying to say here is Something that would have cost, you know, back in your day would have cost $100,000 five years ago, maybe cost $60,000 and today only cost $200. So that the brains and the mechanism that can make a system become an unmanned system is now all over the market and being sold on many different levels, right? So you have dozens of companies that are all creating these flight modules, these flight manage management modules that you can pre-program to fly autonomous missions utilizing GPS waypoints. Um, you know, you can take an off-the-shelf system and you can do all kinds of crazy things with it, right? So, I mean, let's talk about some of the threats. Um, and the, the best thing, and, and this is why I love having a cyber person around and, and, you know, I can take an unmanned system, I can navigate it to, to, to you know, your house, land it on the roof of your house, and utilizing like, you know, a Raspberry Pi, create a Wi-Fi network on your roof of your house, clone your network, and then sit there and, you know, sniff packets all day long that you're going through your emails. How much do you charge uh, for that, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I got a use for that. Yet, but I mean, that's that was something that was being done three years ago, four years ago. Really? Wow. And that's how, that's how long it's been around. So, I mean, you know, I... I, I have an executive protection background, right? And now I tell people that are in the EP background, do you look up? Because now we have to train ourselves to look up. Nobody's looking up anymore. I mean, right. you look at the Angela, Angela Merkel incident a couple of years ago where you had a little AR drone that landed right at, right at her feet. Well, what if that little system wasn't, you know, that, that, you know, that little weak one or it was something a little bit more robust that actually had some explosives on it or something to that extent? It would be a whole different story at this point. Well, I think that's coming. I mean, I worked in a case in Beverly Hills. This was, boy, I'm dating myself. Uh, it's got to be 25 years ago, maybe pushing over 25. And what had happened was somebody had their financial data compromised, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And I didn't really understand the technology at that point. I had just bought a computer, right? But somebody was sitting outside in the car and capturing the screen radiation or screen something off this guy's computer, and he was able to read the screen from outside his car, outside the house. This technology was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So we're way past that now. I mean, somebody landing a drone on your roof and capturing Wi-Fi, I think these are bigger threats than bombs and bullets and terrorism and all the other things we have going on. 
Try drones in your critical infrastructure. That is a big open security threat if not managed correctly. Yeah, especially since they're so small. I mean, what what is the smallest commercial grade drone out there now, uh, James? Oh, I haven't really seen it. They're pretty. Small. There's there's literally there's literally hundreds of these different kinds of systems, and this is why I created my company was because so many different systems out there. How do you figure out which one you want to utilize to do what you want to do? Show that picture, Jarvis, or that little that little one there. I don't know if you can see the screen there, Steve, but there's this little one that's like. You know, about as big as a, a battery uh, above your finger. Is that a real drone? Can you see it on the screen? I unfortunately I can't, but I can show no, you. I, I can show you one that's pretty interesting. Here's a little microsystem. All right. No. Now this one, this one's a couple of years old. Go full it's screen. That, Jarvis. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna Jarvis to go full screen on that. There we go. Okay. So it's it's bigger brother. This one's a few years old, but it's bigger brother now. Um, is the same size and comes with a camera and a microphone built in. So I mean, if this was zipping around, you wouldn't you wouldn't even hear it. You no. wouldn't even notice it, right? And for people on the radio that's, listening to the podcast, that's about as big as uh, it's smaller than a, a playing card, right? As far as I, I'd say it's about the size of a challenge coin, right? So I've got wow. a challenge coin here. Here's a challenge coin. It's about the same size of a challenge coin. So there you go. Wow. With a camera and everything, man. Exactly. So it comes with a camera. So I've got a, a, a PowerPoint. If I can just get it to come up, I'll look. Sure, I'll let's try it. Right. Uh, let's see. Add. Um, I got to get one of these. I don't know what I do with it, but I got I got to I got to do something with it. You got to have the latest technology because they're going to be illegal soon. So you might as well get one now. No, actually, they're not because it's kind of funny we're having this conversation today. The FAA actually. Uh, um, um, have their uh, officiated basically their rule 107 is gone is become is gone online today um rule 107 is the uh is is giving the ability for people to utilize systems commercially and it's created the framework for them to be able to do it a lot more efficiently and easier so uh exactly. amazon is going to deliver my camera equipment with a drone someday They're yeah yeah it's it's around They're already doing it <laughs> So Are they I live, actually? I live, wow. uh, I, live up, I live in the Great White North. I, uh, you know, I'm originally from the states, um, originally from New York, but I now live in Canada. So uh, we actually have in Manitoba, Amazon is now testing their um, their unmanned systems delivery, their you know unmanned system delivery program, which is really cool. So I, can you see my screen? Is it up? Can you guys see? Well, it? we oh, lost oh. something there. We're trying to get you back here. So, hello. So right. This is so, a so we're talking about high tech stuff. We can't get our Skype to work. It's always a problem. Something always happens. <laughs> well, we'll just see if we can get your picture back. There we go. Yeah, we're showing your screen, but we gotta shrink it to fit. Okay, there we go. I think we got it. Okay. Just resizing it. Hold on one second. No worries. We gotta get this camera off my face, Tony. We can't be looking at me all the time. It's gonna lose ratings. Get Sharice back up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here so we go. Now your, your PowerPoint is, is showing. So go ahead and, and run us through it. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, the first thing I want to show is just a, a little bit of a video. Um, it's. Oh, this is that Heineken commercial. This is funny. Oh, it's too loud. Yeah, we don't have any sound on it. Well, what we're watching is it's a Heineken beer commercial. And the guy's sitting on a beach drinking a beer, and here comes a drone delivering a new beer for him. And this is an actual video of the beer being delivered, which is kind of amazing. Oh, but it gets better. Yeah, we don't have any sound on that one. So if we have his next video, we should play that. So James, we'll play the next video for you because we're not getting sound on yours. And I want people to see that next video too. We're just going to get it right from uh, from YouTube. So there now, you go. now, the next one we're going to play. Uh, oh, wait, we so we'll get to the next one in a second. Right. So this, this slide that I'm showing you right now, so it's uh, an off-the-shelf system, and what I mean by an off-the-shelf system is I mean a system that you can buy at any big box store, right? Okay. Uh, you can see, it, it, you know, the range is 4,921 feet. So I mean, if you look at the at the at the illustration that I have here, it's dwarfing, you know, some of the largest skyscrapers in the world, right? I mean, oh yeah. We're heading into, we we're got heading the pyramids into and the Eiffel Center, Tower. Seven territory at this point. So to to translate this from the podcast, we're looking at a, a graph, and it has. The pyramids on the left, Eiffel Tower on the right. Well, I got some feedback. Got some turn feedback. your volume down there, so, James. Uh, so these can go halfway up the Eiffel Tower and almost to the top of a pyramid. It's amazing. 
Well, actually, that's yeah. not the Eiffel Tower. That's the that's the projected uh, um, X speed uh, building uh, for the future. The Eiffel Tower is all the way down at the bottom. Oh. Uh, if you look over on the left hand wow. side. So the next, uh, the next one that I'm going to show, okay, so, you know, in the United States, this, this is the uh, systems registered for recreational use. So this is just a, basically a map of every single system that's used for just for fun, right? And, uh, you know, if, if you look at this map, it's peppered. I mean, there's people who have got registered systems all throughout the U.S. Now, tell me why it has to be registered. Is, is that a requirement? So the reason, yeah, it is actually, if you want to own and fly a system in the United States, it has to be registered through the FAA. And the reason why is they, they basically want to have accountability. The FAA is, is all about safety, right? And uh, the main thing is, is that they're trying to keep the skies as safe as possible. And this is why they created the Rule 107 framework and so on. So the next one is, uh, this one right here, is systems registered for commercial use. And you can see there's a considerable amount less of of that uh, of these registered systems throughout the United States, so I mean you know the thing is is that there's there's hundreds of thousands of these things in the U.S. currently being used. Um, here's a map of any given day of operations, and what you're looking at right now is a map of the United States. The red circles are no fly zones. Um, this is uh, from a website called Sky Vector, and it's supposed to be used by uh, commercial drone pilots and actual pilots. Uh, the purple are unmanned aerial systems being flown, and these are their flight plans. You know, these are their potential flight plans. So you can see the purple. These are all the unmanned systems that are being flown throughout the U.S. The red is the no-fly zones, and you can actually, you know, uh, on Sky Vector, you can actually zoom in and see, you know, who's flying what and where potentially. And oh, these are going. these are like live rep representation of people flying drones. Right, oh. exactly. So when you fly when you fly a drone, uh, an unmanned system commercially in the U.S., you have to register your flight plan, and you have to uh, file for your exemptions and everything through the FAA, and then it gets uploaded into the system, and you know you basically have to uh, make sure that you're not flying around the airport, and there's no um, you know there's no temporary flight restrictions going on or anything to that extent. Well, it makes so you feel a little better, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying. So if you could, I'm sorry, go ahead. That makes you feel a little better that they're trying to keep track of these things. Give us the website uh, address for that that page. It's, uh, it's uh, www.skyvector.com. All right, cool. All right. So the next one, if you could play the video, that would be great. Now, this is, uh, we're playing this off YouTube. Of uh, Is this from a movie or what is this, Steve? A commercial or what? So, I mean, uh, James. Uh, so this is, a, this is actually a movie. Um, last year, uh, a gentleman put together the second part of it, but this is actually a television show based out of the UK. But I found it so realistic as to you know what can happen. All right. That um, you know I just I had to show it. Right. I mean this is just unbelievable. So. Okay, we're rolling right now. So for a podcast, we're watching a helicopter and a drone has just struck the uh, rear stabilized propeller. Just a small drone that hit the, the back uh, rotor, I guess you call it. So just that small drone is able to take down a helicopter, full-size helicopter. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that some of these lipo batteries are, are you know, a considerable chunk, right? I mean... Helicopters and, and, and aircraft are create are built to certain specifications to deal with, for example. Hold on one second. We're going to see this next. Now, the punchline of that last video was that a kid had just did it by accident. Now, this is an actual video of an actual airplane flight, correct? No, this is a this was another uh, um, a rendering of what could potentially happen. Oh, I see. Uh, last year, this was considered a uh, it was a spoof, right? So, it kind of people people actually thought this did happen. Um, on this flight, but it didn't, you know, and then they showed the breakdown of how it happened. But again, it gives the, it gives the illustration of what can happen, what it can look like and how simple it can happen and how simple it can, it can just happen. And that's all right? technically well, possible now because of the battery life of the drones yeah. and the flight heights and how high they can go. And it's all, it's all doable now. Well, think about it. 4,000 feet, right? So a 747 flies at, at over 5,000 feet. 
um, and a drone, a drone, one of some of these off the shelf systems can go in at, at 4,500 feet. Um, I own several systems. I have a much more robust systems and the issue, you know, th because they're more robust, they do have much more capability than these off the shelf systems. So, I mean, if I really, if I could legally do it to push the limits, I'm pretty sure I could get really, really, you know, I can get up there to six, 7,000 feet. Which is well within the landing height of a, of an aircraft or helicopter or anything. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's dangerous so. zones. That's very dangerous. All right, it's 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 past that. So I mean, you got to kind of look at it. You know, if if you had somebody who was really motivated to do something, you could land a you could land a system virtually on any building, and it could have any type of payload. And at that point, you could do whatever you wanted. So, I mean, you know, it, it's it's scary. It, it's scary and it's already here. It's not like it, this was, you know, it's not like it's three years from now. It's actually right now. Right. This is happening right, right now. So, so let's let's do a quick review. So I, I go out and buy a drone. I have to, oh, what are we seeing there, Tony? Is that a gun mounted on a drone? Yeah, I saw that video on uh, YouTube a while back where somebody mounted a, a 9 millimeter and was firing it from a drone. Yeah. And it worked perfectly. Yeah, that, that, that the kid in Connecticut is actually still dealing with the legal uh, legal issues with regard to creating that because it's really, he did really didn't break any laws. He kind of just bent them a little bit. Right, right. But, uh, um, the, this picture that you're looking at right here is a, is a we'll call it an artist rendition or just a, just a mock-up of a, of a system that somebody's looking to put together. And that's a semi-automatic rifle. So, I mean, you know, you want to talk about doing crazy things with simple things. This is one of these. This is a prime example of what you can do. And there's nothing special here, Chuck. There's nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. There's nothing that you can't buy on the market right now. Every single one of these things, pieces that's making this uh, possible, you can buy right now. Talk to, so. talk to me about, uh, you know, payloads and weights and what, what can these things lift? It seems like they're they're like an ant. They can lift more than their apparent apparent weight or something, right? Am I wrong? It's in no, you're not. So, yeah. um, so, again, like I was talking about earlier, one of my systems, I have a 12-motor uh, beast, um, runs carbon fiber blades, and it's really big. It's about 1,000 millimeters. Um, its max payload right now is 35 pounds. 35 pounds, it's wow. A, it's got a cruising speed of approximately 75 to 80 miles an hour. Wait, is that fully it's loaded? Very, it's 75, 80 miles an hour? Fully, that's fully loaded, and it has the ability to, uh, to fly about 30 to 35 minutes. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so what, exactly. what frequency are these controlled under, and is it possible to be intercepted and compromised? That is a fantastic question, and thank you for asking that. Darn it, you Trace, know, you get all the good uh, questions. So let's let's break it down into into the simplicity of it. Uh, frequency: Can we can we jam or can we interfere with a frequency? Can we hack it? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's all about command and control, and I can debunk command and control in less than thirty seconds. You know, you can take one of these off the shelf controls controllers, um, like I'm like the one I'm holding up right here. This is just a typical RC controller used for, utilized for any to any type of uh, you know any type of flying thing, and I can utilize this system, program it, and Chuck, the second I turn it off, it erases all the settings. Put that up one more so, time, James. Let's see, let's see that one so more time. How do, you, how do you prove command and control when I've just erased all the settings by simply turning the controller off, right? Oh, so it doesn't, it doesn't have to go through a, a network. It's just no. it's point to point, right? Point to point, but the, the now, here's the, now here's the other interesting part. So some of these flight uh, some of these flight systems utilize you know um, uh, better much better technology and computers where you can actually pre-program a system to fly an autonomous mission utilizing GPS waypoints and once you hit enter that's it it's done it goes off and it flies its mission and it'll come back uh, if that's what you want it to do or it'll land someplace else utilizing GPS technology now but there's a Let's I'm back sorry? up. Let's back up and review so my my small brain can get a hold of this. So I buy a drone off the shelf at Toys R Us. I'm not flying it for commercial use. I still have to register it with somebody. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. If it's commercial, I got to register it like it's an airplane, and I got to register a flight pattern. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. You got to follow Rule 107. You have to, you know, go through the training. You have to go through flight yeah. training to understand nautical. And I mean, there's a like there's a laundry list of yeah, like your you pilot. All right. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you're a pilot. So I always but, like to I always like to think like an evil just, evil if genius. You're just a civilian. If you're just a civilian and you're not utilizing it commercially, no, you do not. You just need to, you know, basically fly within the rules and regulations that the FAA has posed. But I mean, how many how many people are actually going to do that? So you know, you've got these systems that can fly pre-programmed missions. There was a kid in Brooklyn that uh, uh, Brooklyn, New York, that developed a uh, algorithm that allows a drone to fly utilizing uh, Starbucks Wi-Fi hotspots. <laughs> so he was able to fly his drone through the city. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to you know talk about exactly where, but he was able to fly it through the city utilizing the Wi-Fi hotspots from Starbucks automatically, so, so to speak. It flew itself, exactly. in other words. Completely autonomously, outside of his control, um, you know, and, and it's it's this kind of technology that makes things, you know, scary. So, I mean, let's, <clears throat> the, the, the thing is, is that it brings up another, it brings up another one of, another part of this, which is IoT, right, which is the Internet of Things. Um, all technology that's being built now, all the phones and watches and computers and refrigerators and, uh, thermostats and everything that's being built are all being built with certain chipsets. And these chipsets allow all these different devices to intercommunicate. Okay. So that means your watch is going to talk to your refrigerator. Your refrigerator is going to talk to your car. Your car is going to talk to your, you know, your email account and let you know that you're out of milk and you need, a, you need an oil change. So, I mean, this is great for people. This is great for the future. I mean, this is the way it is, but it, it, it's, it's that interconnection that we're, that's going to cause the problem, right? So now the same interconnection that's in, in, in watches and phones is the same interconnection that's in drones, okay? So now hackers, can, hackers have the ability to, to blow through some of these security protocols like, like it was no problem, hack these systems, and have them do every single thing that they've ever wanted them to do. So this ultimately leads me to this point. Um, it's the unintended consequence. We've developed all these wonderful technologies to do all these great things, but we're not thinking of security as a main part of right. the creation. Never is. And that's the problem. That's the biggest problem because, you know, I can take a flight system that's built on a Lin that's built on a Linux platform, utilizing Linux kernels, blow through it, reprogram it because it's open source, and have it do whatever I want. And I'm just, you know, I'm just a, a ground pounder. I'm just an old, you know, I'm an old guard. That's what I am. I'm not a techie. You know, so imagine if I took one of these techies and I put them, you know, I put them to it. Imagine what they could do. And they are already doing. That's the point. Right? I mean, I'm working with some, I'm working with some really great people. Um, I'm working with a gentleman. His name's Patrick Doherty. He runs a company called Pleiades Robotics in Halifax. And he's developing some great technology. Um, with regard to unmanned systems, he's creating the actual first flying autonomous robot, not a drone, a robot. So that's what kind of really sets things apart. I recently got together with another fella. Um, his name is Jackie Wu from 89 Robotics. You know, he's he's also creating some great things. And he's actually going to be at ASIS Texas night to give away a drone, which is oh, wow. uh, yeah, going to be a great time. You know, the Chuck Andrews over at FOC. Um, you oh, know, he's putting a great show together. He's got me going to be out there. Jackie's going to be out there. We're going to be giving away a drone, showing off, talking about all kinds of great things. Yeah, we're going to try and broadcast live from there, too, with my new equipment. See if we can get that up on yeah, that's live stream. Be, that's going to be a whole yeah. lot of fun. I finally get to meet you face to face, which is going to be. And you get to meet me, too. Cyberjob's going to be there. Great. You know, so, I mean, it's it's. I've been uh, labeled the drone guy at ASIS. I'm the drone guy for FOC now. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's. We've got a lot of great things that are happening, but the main thing is, is you really got to realize that this one, you know, there are no countermeasures for this. So, I mean, don't think you can go outside and shoot one down with your shotgun because it, it's not realistic. You've got an unrealistic ex ex expectation of what you're going to be able to do to defend yourself. Um, law enforcement's going to have a hell of a time trying to, you know, stop little Johnny Jones in the backyard flying his little system around and peeking into the neighbor's yard and stuff like that. I mean, there's going to be just so many different things that people are going to have to manage. And, you know, it's, it's the scary part is, is that again, it's the cart before the horse. Like I said before, we're developing this technology with not, with security not being in the forefront of the development. 
we're allowing people to fly systems without having a real ability or, or having a, a way of being able to a countermeasure that can counter that drone. I mean, you can utilize jamming, but jamming only works on a command and control system. That's a system that's under the control of, of a pilot. Jamming doesn't work on a system that's pre-programmed, okay? Wow. Well, now, why wouldn't it, though? If I could send some kind of signal to interfere with the circuit board on your drone, like a burst, wouldn't that do something? It actually, it wouldn't, because um, once I hit enter on the programming and it hits up to the board, it's pre-programmed to do what it does. It doesn't accept any signals until no. it completes its mission. So, I mean, you could, you could try to jam the GPS on it, and then I'll create a fail-safe that'll just tell it to keep flying on the same flight path that it was already on. Oh, yeah. So, oh, I mean, yeah. you know, there's – every time somebody – so I've, I've been in a few tabletop exercises, and, um, you know, I've just kind of said to people, there's, you, there's really no way you can protect yourself from this. You really have to understand the threat, and you have to be able to manage it, right? And we all know in security it's threat, vulnerability, and consequences. What's the threat? What's our vulnerability? And ultimately, what's the consequences? And we have to be able to deter, detect, delay, and then response. Well, guess what? We, can, we can't deter it. We can detect it, kind of. Um, we can't really delay it. And then what's going to be our response, right? So I, you know, I've been at this going on almost five years now. I actually developed a, uh, a, a firearms training course to teach law enforcement and private security on how to uh, take a drone down if you have to. But I just want to kind of show you this as, a, as another example. This is a carbon fiber five inch blade, okay? This was on a system that we were shooting double lot buck at. And ultimately it didn't come down. All it did was just vibrate the bird. So, I mean, you really can't, you, you try to shoot one down, all you're gonna do is just put holes in it. Right. Okay, and like I said, I can land one on your house, create a Wi-Fi hotspot. I can, I can have it follow your cell phone. I can have it follow you. Uh, utilizing facial recognition software. I mean, there's a laundry list of things we can do with drones. So, I mean, there's a lot of positive that's coming out of this. I, exactly. There's a lot of positive things, right? Um, you can utilize it. You know, there's some, uh, and I think it's in, in Denmark or Belgium. I'm not too sure right now. Um, they're trying to create a drone that can uh, send, um, um, uh, uh, oh, shoot, uh, paddles, uh, not paddles. What do you call it? The... Um, uh, defibrillator, like a defibrillator oh, yeah. drone, and they're trying to utilize the. Uh, oh, um, I've seen that. Know. I saw that. Yeah. That's a real right. thing. Yeah, that's a real thing. They've got the EpiPen drone. Um, they've got the medic drone, the medical drone. They've got blood drones. They've got all kinds of different ones in Africa. You've got blood, blood, you know, you know, whole blood being flown over long distances utilizing a quadcopter. So I mean, there's tons of good that can be done with this. But again, it comes back to. We need to manage the technology properly because if we don't, we're going to end up in a really we're going to end up in a hard space. Now, we're when really are hard. when or has it happened already? Uh, are people going to start using this for assassinations, non-military use? It's, it it must have happened already, or it's going to happen soon. So look at look at the kid the kid in Connecticut who put who put the Glock on the drone. Um, that was the one that you were referencing earlier. The kid was really smart. Uh, he knew, you know, he, he, he built it to the point where he actually compensated for the recoil of the weapon. Okay, Chuck. So now I have a Glock, I have a Glock drone and I'm flying it through downtown and I start randomly shooting people. And how do you prove that it was me? How do you prove I had command and control of that system? Well, if you automatically it program it to possible. hit, if it hits Starbucks uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, like in the other scenario, you can't prove anything. You can't. And that's a problem. So, I mean, we're giving people... You know, you've got you've got gangs, uh, you know, drug cartels that are using drones to fly narcotics over the Mexican border. You've got gangs that are trying to that are using drones to fly drugs and narcotics, weapons and cell phones into prisons. I had a video of a, a great video of a of a drone flying at a prison trying to swing a package into the into the uh, into a window. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it to work right on my on my oh. computer. But I mean, it's it's there, right? It's there. It's already happening. You know, the, it's it's the worst parts that you can think of. And the thing is, is that it's not. I've been trying to get this on people's radar, and it's not right. Like people don't think about a drone. They think it's just this little toy that you know, little Johnny Jones is flying in the backyard. But um, here's one of my micro, one of my smaller systems. 
And this one's a little speed demon. He clocks in around 95 miles an hour. He's 95 miles an hour? 95 miles an hour. He's got a flight time of about 20, 22 minutes. And he can handle about a three-pound payload. Okay, Man. so that's three pounds in addition to his battery pack and everything else. Now, can I hire you to drop some Security Guy Radio flyers? Can we get some more <laughs> listeners or something? That'd be, that'd be a good use of it, I think. Get people listening to the show. Unbelievable. Now I'm waiting for i waiting for somebody to pull one of these out at As Is. You know, As Is is a giant convention, huge hall, and I just know some year we're going to have somebody launch a drone in there on one of these pre-programmed things you say, as some kind of advertising <laughs> scheme or something, and start flying around, and it's going to flip people out, right? So I tried. I actually tried doing that at ASIS a couple of years ago, and there was so much interference in the hall that I couldn't get my drone to take off and and, and calibrate itself. And I ended up crashing like four times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know why that is, because uh, I'm trying to get the Wi-Fi connection at as is, and it's going to cost me $6,000 if I want that to happen. <laughs> it's something to do with who owns the signals, and they actually have some kind of, a, I don't know if it's a jamming equipment, but they want you to use their internal stuff. So I could see why that might not work, but somebody will do a workaround. They'll figure out how to do it eventually. No, they always do. They yeah. always do. So, I mean... You know, some of the countermeasures that are out there, people are using a lot, utilizing like, uh, you know, nets and they're trying to do jamming. Uh, the Secret Service just purchased, um, you know, a, 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 um, a jamming rifle. Um, oh, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. So not not really just, effective, though. Got a bunch of them. Yeah, again, it's again, it, it comes back to my core, th my core statement of it only works on command and control systems. Right. Um, so it won't work on a potentially it won't work on a system that's flying an autonomous mission. So I mean that's that's part of the issue. Um, again, I think you're going to see a ban um, on autonomous flying time uh, from the FFA to ma kind of manage. No, I don't because right now um, I'm not I'm not going to mention any names. However, several or excuse me, there are a handful of um, uh, drone companies or, or, I guess, service providers that now have the ability to operate beyond the line of sight. So beyond the line of sight operation means that removes command and control. So that means I visually don't have to have a, an eye on my drone. Um, it means that now I can fly potentially two, three, four, five miles away from my original, original location. So what does that mean? That means that uh, they're open to the the FAA is open to the thought of being able to fly beyond that. I mean that wow. that's a great thing. It's a good thing. It's a great thing for for some um, for, for good some, use for some uses for for you know. But if you if you have somebody again with that intent, you know. Well, a flight a flight restriction would be irrelevant, uh, just like gun control is irrelevant because really. Uh, if I want to do something bad, I'm going to follow your FAA rule and not fly. I'm just going to program it to be autonomous, and nobody's going to know who it is, and I'm going to send it out to do its thing, and that's it. It's not going to, it's not going to do a thing, actually. And that's exactly the problem, okay? So we know the FAA is a safety organization. You know, they're, de they're going to be depending on our nation's law enforcement to, to, try, to, to try to enforce these rules I mean, all they're going to ultimately, all the FAA does can give you a civil suit and slap you on the hand and give you a fine if they catch you. And that's if they catch you, right? Well, and, so, and the lesser uh, flying a drone to kill somebody, I don't really care if I get a ticket for flying my drone outside of hours because I just killed somebody with it. So it's irrelevant to use that as any type of enforcement tool. It's just, it's not going to be effective. There has to be another way to come up with it. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to, um, so... We're so going to be we talking got about, about we, yeah we got about uh, two minutes. So you're going to be at As Is 2016 yeah, Orlando. Yeah, going to be weeks. speaking at As Is on um, on September the uh, 12th at okay. 11 o'clock in the main hall. Um, and I'm also I've got a poster presentation that's on Tuesday. I think it's 11 o'clock also. Um, and it's all about obviously it's all about drones. So I mean it's uh, we've got Texas night. We're going to be at. We're going to have a great time there. We're going to give a drone away. We're gonna fly it around. Hopefully, get some pictures and and uh, and you know just overall have a great time. So I mean, you know, I want to. It's it's gonna be a blast, right? I mean, we're gonna have some fun with FOC and Chuck and everything. Well, it's been a really interesting uh, show. And Sharice, I don't feel good again. I feel good at Black Hat, yeah. and I don't feel good. I feel very ungood. Mr. Jarvis, do you feel not good about this? It's not good. I know, but but it's very informative. So I want to thank you guys for coming in, uh, James Acevedo of. Uh, 
uh, oh, help, I'm, I'm having a brain dead. Give me the company again. It's Star, Star River. River. Star River. That's right. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, boy. All I'm thinking about is some drone landing on my house with a Wi-Fi spot. They're going to they're gonna be able to log in and see all my porn and stuff. That's not a good thing to do. You guys are too evasive. It's no good. All right. Thanks for coming on Security Radio. We'll see you at Black Hat. I'm mean, sorry. See you at As Is in a couple weeks. And um, See you guys in a couple you weeks. you got to come on again all and give right. us some updates every month about this stuff. It's just kind of scary. Thanks for tuning in to Security Radio. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys.